regarding the wallet being very identifiable, it sort of looks like it's all like this. 911, what's your emergency? Hello everyone, welcome to episode 16 of my series, Graphs and Crimes. My name is Kelly of Miss Kelly's Gifts. Every week, I post a new video of myself crafting while talking about a different true crime case. This week, I will be discussing the case of serial killer Israel Keys. Israel Keys was born on January 7th, 1978 in Richmond, Utah. He was the second of 10 children born to John and Heidi Keyes. From the time of his birth until he was five years old, Keyes and his siblings were raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the LDS or Mormon Church. In 1983, John Keyes decided to leave the Mormon Church and moved his family to a remote plot of land near Colville, Washington. The Keyes family were isolated from society, living in a one-room cabin with no running water or electricity. They would attend services at a local church known as the Ark. This church was alleged to have practiced white supremacy Christian identity ideology and was later described by Israel Keyes as having an Amish-like church environment. On a random side note, while living in this remote area and attending these church services at the Ark, the Keyes family would go on to befriend a neighboring family whose patriarch, Chevy Keogh, would go on to become a convicted triple murderer. The Keyes family would also attend another church in the area known as Christian Israel Covenant Church. This church taught British Israelism as doctrine, that miscegenation was an abomination, and that Anglo-Saxons were to rule over the perceived inferior races. It was also alleged that this church was militia-like. For years, several of the Keys' children would be forced to sleep in tents because of the size of the family's cabin. In order to survive, the children were forced to hunt their own food, chop firewood, and work on local farms to help support the family. Israel Keyes freely admitted that in his youth, he enjoyed shooting his BB gun at neighbors' houses, starting fires in the woods, and breaking into houses for fun. 14-year-old Israel Keyes, who stood at six foot two, was known to sell stolen guns to local adults after breaking into houses. As a hobby, he would hunt, quote, anything with a heartbeat and brag to his peers at church about skinning a deer alive. This led to him being ostracized and actively avoided by the other youths who attended the Christian Israel Covenant Church. One girl that attended the church later said of Israel Keys that his presence made her skin crawl. It was also around this time that he allegedly had an epiphany that he wasn't like his peers who kept running from him. Keys began to keep his increasing antisocial behavior to himself while withdrawing socially due to being ostracized. During his teenage years, Israel Keyes became a skilled carpenter, building his first cabin at 16 years old. He began working for a contractor in Colville from 1995 to 1997. He began keeping a diary at this time. It was filled with scripture and documentation of his daily sins, such as lusting after his girlfriend. In the late 1990s, the Keys were once again on the move, this time to Smyrna, Maine. They collected sap to make maple syrup in a mostly Amish community. It was during this time in Maine that Israel renounced his Christian faith, and while having a particularly heated argument with his parents, he declared his atheism. John and Heidi Keyes kicked their eldest son out of the family home, calling him blasphemous and ordering their younger children to shun their brother. 
After being evicted and having no contact with his family, Israel Keyes began to develop a keen interest in Satanism. He wanted to commit a ritualistic murder. Although the exact year is unclear, Israel Keyes allegedly committed his first crime in the summer of either 1997 or 1998 at the Deschutes River in Maupin, Oregon. He abducted a teenage girl between the ages of 14 to 18 years old at knife point before dragging her back into the tree line along the river and sexually assaulting her. Keyes planned to murder the teenager as part of a satanic ritual, but instead he let her go in a tube down the river. I was too timid. I wasn't violent enough, he told investigators. I made up my mind I was never going to let that happen again. On July 9th, 1998, Israel Keyes relocated to New York, where he enlisted in the Army. He passed a rigorous month-long preliminary course for Army Ranger training. During his time in the military, he was stationed at Fort Lewis in Washington and Fort Hood in Texas, as well as being stationed abroad in Egypt. While in Egypt, Israel befriended several other soldiers and even told one of them that he would, quote, like to kill him. In February 2001, Keyes was arrested for driving under the influence in Thurston County, Washington. In July 2001, Israel Keyes was honorably discharged from the U.S. Army and received an Army Achievement Medal for his meritorious service. After being discharged from the military, Israel Keyes relocated to the Maka Reservation in Nia Bay, Washington, on the Olympic Peninsula. In 2007, he started his own construction business, Keyes Construction, in Alaska. Israel Keyes has only been linked to three confirmed victims, but is suspected to have murdered at least 11 people. Keyes was a very dangerous sort of serial killer because he planned murders long ahead of time and took extraordinary action to avoid detection. Unlike most serial killers, he did not have a victim profile, saying he chose a victim randomly. He usually killed far from home and never in the same area twice. While traveling to commit his crimes, he would switch off his phone and only pay in cash. In 2011, Israel Keyes flew to Chicago before renting a car and driving 1,100 miles to Essex, Vermont. He first dug up a murder kit he buried in the area two years earlier before breaking into the home of 49-year-old William Scott Courier and 55-year-old Lorraine Simone Courier. On the evening of June 8, 2011, he tied up the couple before driving them to an abandoned farmhouse. There, Keyes shot Bill before sexually assaulting and strangling Lorraine to death. After the murders, he reburied the murder kit, this time in Parrishville, New York, where it would remain hidden until after his arrest. Unfortunately, the bodies of Bill and Lorraine Courier have never been located. Before we discuss the victim that would bring down this monster, I want to talk a little bit about his suspected victims. 12-year-old Cassandra Cassie Emerson was reported missing after the remains of her mother, 29-year-old Marlene K. Emerson, were found in their burnt-out trailer in Colville on June 27, 1997. Cassie's remains were discovered 13 miles away from her home in 1998. Keyes did admit to investigators that his first act of arson was a trailer in Colville, and when they asked his ex fiance she stated that she believed he was responsible for this crime. Israel Keyes also claimed to have murdered five other victims in Washington State. One victim he buried or submerged in a lake near Nebay between July and October 2001. 
a couple between 2001 to 2005. The man was allegedly beaten to death and the woman fatally strangled. Two more unidentified victims between 2005 and 2006. One was allegedly dumped in Lake Crescent. Although he didn't have any felony conviction record in Washington state, he was stopped twice for driving offenses. In 2012, authorities found one possible victim of Keys known only as the Lewis County Jane Doe. Her body was discovered by passing motorists on April 7, 2011 in the Peterman Hill area of Morton, Washington. Israel Keyes is suspected of a series of murders in 2007 committed by the, quote, Boca Killer in Boca Raton, Florida. 52-year-old Randy Ann Malitz Gorenberg was abducted on March 23, 2007 from a parking lot at Boca Town Center Mall. Her body was found within an hour with two fatal bullet wounds. An unidentified woman and her two-year-old son were abducted from the same parking lot and forced at gunpoint to withdraw money from an ATM before being released. Although the abductor wore a ski mask and sunglasses, the woman was able to see the man's face and her description generally matched Keys. 47-year-old Nancy Bacchio and her 7-year-old Joey Bacchio Hauser were found fatally shot in their car in the Boca Town Center Mall on December 12, 2007. Authorities found searches on Keyes' computer related to the missing person case of 48-year-old Deborah Feldman, a missing sex worker from Hackensack, New Jersey. She was last seen in her apartment on April 8, 2009, and unfortunately, her remains have never been located, but it is suspected that she may be buried near Tupper Lake, New York. When Israel Keyes was shown her photograph, he allegedly hesitated before responding that he, quote, didn't want to talk about her yet. Madison Geraldine Scott was last seen in the early morning hours of May 28, 2011, in Hogsback Lake near Vanderhof, British Columbia, after attending a party at a campsite. Hogsback Lake was a 33-hour drive from Anchorage, where Keyes was living at the time. By his own admission, he liked to abduct people from remote places, such as campsites, and he frequently traveled into Canada. When he was asked about whether he had killed anyone in Canada, he said, Canadians don't count. 58-year-old James Lamar Tidwell Jr. disappeared from Mount Enterprise, Texas on February 12, 2012. He was last seen at 5.30 a.m. after finishing a night shift. On February 16, 2012, Keyes admitted to robbing a bank in Azle, Texas. During the robbery, he was wearing a hard hat that matched Tidwell's and a wig with dark hair that also matched the missing man. While being interrogated, Keyes stated that his, quote, wig was in fact human hair. When asked where he had obtained the human hair, Keyes refused to elaborate but said, you don't have to buy real hair to get real hair. On February 1st, 2012, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was abducted from Common Grounds Coffee in Anchorage, Alaska while finishing up her shift. She was approached by a man wearing a ski mask, later identified as Israel Keys. The man ordered a coffee before pulling out a gun, demanding money, and Samantha complied. Keys forced himself inside the kiosk, zip-tied the young woman's hands, and forced her into his car. He kept the terrified Koenig alive for several hours, even returning to the kiosk at one point to retrieve her phone. He lied to the girl and told her this was a kidnap for ransom, and if she did as she was told, he would release her. 
Keyes took Samantha to his property, where he put her in his shed and turned up the radio so no one could hear her scream, while he went to her boyfriend's house to steal her debit card from his truck. While stealing the debit card, Keyes was confronted by Samantha's boyfriend, who was already on edge after discovering that Koenig was not at work when he arrived to pick her up. After returning to his property, Israel Keyes then proceeded to sexually assault Samantha before strangling her to death. Leaving the young woman's body in his shed, Keyes then prepared to leave on a pre-planned cruise with his daughter. On February 17th, 2012, after returning from his vacation, he began preparing a ransom note. Keyes proceeded to remove Samantha Koenig's body from the shed, applying makeup and sewing her eyelids open with fish in line before taking a photo of her, quote, holding up that day's newspaper. He typed up a note demanding $30,000, left the note and the photo at a local park, and used Samantha's phone to text her boyfriend the location of the note. A few days later, Israel Keyes drove Samantha's body to the Mantauska Lake before cutting a hole in the ice and disposing of her dismembered body. At the same time, Samantha's father, James, was depositing the $30,000 into his daughter's account following the kidnapper's instructions because he believed his daughter was still alive. Because Keyes had instructed the family to deposit the money into their daughter's account, authorities were able to determine he was driving a white Ford Focus. On March 13th, 2012, Israel Keyes was arrested in the parking lot of the Cotton Patch Cafe in Lufkin, Texas. Keyes was stopped after he drove slightly over the speed limit. Inside the car, police found a ski mask, dye-stained bills from a bank robbery, a gun, and Samantha's phone and debit card. He was subsequently extradited back to Alaska, where he confessed to Samantha Koenig's murder. He cooperated to an extent, confessing to some of his crimes, and stated a wish to be executed within a year. Keyes said he wanted to avoid publicity due to the negative attention his young daughter might face, but largely stopped cooperating after his identity was discussed in the media. On March 23rd, 2012, he attempted to escape from a routine hearing, but was tased by police before he could make it very far. While being held at the Anchorage Correctional Complex, Israel Keyes managed to conceal a razor blade in his cell. On December 2nd, 2012, he died by slitting his own wrists and attempting to strangle himself. Under his body was a rambling letter that was later called a creepy ode to murder, which offered no clues as to the identities of his unnamed victims, but rather described them as pretty captive butterflies. On December 10th, 2012, Key's mother, Heidi, and four of his sisters attended a small funeral service for Keyes in Deer Park, Washington. The pastor opened the services by saying, he is not in a better place, he begun. He is in a place of eternal torment. In 2020, photos of drawings of 11 skulls and a pentagram all drawn in blood were released to the public. They were found under Israel Key's jail cell bed. It is believed that the number of skulls correlates to the number of victims. Unfortunately, we may never fully know exactly how many lives Israel Keys ended for his own sick satisfaction. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Crafts and Crimes. If you're interested in the things I'm crafting, please check out the links in the description. If you found this video interesting, please leave a like and comment below with what future cases you want me to talk about. Don't forget to subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. I'll see you all next time.